Beloved mighty I am presence, beloved Lord God Almighty, raise up within us now the living fountain of the Divine Mother. We call to all elemental life, Oramesis and Diana, Aries and Thor, Neptune and Luara, Virgo and Pelur. Secure the four sides of the base of the pyramid in matter, the living temple of man and God in manifestation. Beloved body elemental, come under the dominion now of our own holy Christ self and I am presence. Mighty threefold flame from the heart of God. Expand and overflow the boundaries of being. Extend in generous portion our love, our wisdom, our will to do thy will, O God, unto all life. Expand my narrow room, O God. Intensify and accentuate the mighty aura of the aqua ray of Saint Germain, the healing light of Mother Mary, the purity of the God flame. We call to beloved mighty Astraea to encircle us now, to let all light invoked by these devotees of living flame saturate their forms, exalt God consciousness, raise up a spiral of resurrection's flame. Let us be thyself in action, O Archangel Michael. I am that I am, Michael, come forth now in the victory of the God flame. Deliberate with us and perfect us for the work and the joy and the word of the Lord ahead. In the name Elohim, in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and the Divine Mother. Amen. Beloved Virgo and Pelur.
You let us sing to beloved God to bore the God of the mountains number 403.
Thank you. Won't you be seated? We will sit while we sing to Neptune and Luara, number 401. Beloved mighty I am presence, we call now to our beloved holy Christ self to enfold our body elemental, to fortify our body elemental for our victory in this temple, in the physical octave, fire, air, water, and earth. We call for this action of the sacred fire. We call for the preparation of our bodies to make any transition in this octave and the next. We call for the weaving of the deathless solar body, the purification of mind and heart and soul, and the dissolution by violet flame of all karmic residual substance within every cell and atom and molecule of our being, within every organ, our central nervous system, our bone structure, our brain. We call for this action of the sacred fire throughout the endocrine system and all systems of our bodies. Blaze the full power of the blood now and let it be the essence of the living Christ. O violet flame, wash us clean that we might perform the service of the Lord. Sanat Kumara in this year of our Lord, 1988.
elementals like the songs. I'm up here to balance a bit of karma this evening, and I hope you will indulge me. Uh, it's very important that I set the record straight, because you know what the masters always tell us. If we ever leave any erroneous example, and then we take our ascension, we may have many, many lifetimes in heaven trying to undo that incorrect example. And so now that I have such a wide audience of all of you, who have heard me from time to time, and brand new students who haven't heard me before, I have a chance to give my corrections on a very key subject. A subject, in fact, that I have been studying in many levels since the earliest times of my life, and that is human health. And I began my search for human health by studying science and health with Key to the Scriptures by Mary Baker Eddy. And I was absorbed in those teachings from the age of nine until I entered the path of training to be a messenger. And so I came to the place where I had had an exhaustive study and experience with those teachings, all of the writings of Mary Baker Eddy, and had worked for the Mother Church in Boston for the Christian Science Monitor, and uh, served in youth groups, and uh, was very active in every way. So I saw human health and human existence from the level of the absolute awareness of God good as the only reality, and in the denial of all that was error and that was evil. When I came to the feet of El Moria, and I surrendered all that might be erroneous doctrine in that particular religion, I had to come to the realization that the denial of matter, as taught by Christian science and other metaphysical organizations, is actually a misnomer. Uh, science today is actually showing the unreality of matter, but I don't think it is in the sense that Christian scientists interpret Mary Baker Eddy's writings. Their interpretation is, pure and simple, that this existence is not real. It may not be real in the absolute sense, but matter, as the Ascended Masters came to make me realize, is Mater, the Divine Mother, in expression in this time-space continuum created for ourselves in order that we might evolve, balance our karma, and return to the higher octaves from whence we came. So in those higher octaves, we did not experience matter as the density that we experience it today but more as a divine polarity of the yin and yang, the alpha and omega, plus and minus of creation. But God had his way of creating for us a compartment of consciousness, a density of matter, that was the equivalent of our karma and our vibration, a place where we could be comfortable, but not too comfortable. So we wouldn't want to stay here forever because that problem is already besetting the laggard races of the physical universe. And the laggard races, of course, prefer to assert the status quo of their wealth, their success, their power, their position. And they do not desire to see this change, and they have no desire to accelerate or to ascend. Uh, bad news to the world and to the laggards today that the great wave of light from the great central sun is accelerating. And the good news of that light is that if we move with the wave, and accelerate with it, we are going to wind up at the point of the source of the wave, which is exactly where we would like to be in the heart of God in the great central sun. This acceleration, then, is an acceleration of the material universe. And it's a most profound experience to be wearing these bodies uh, of clay, they say, and they tell us, as other mortals wear, and yet to realize that our bodies are integrating with the etheric sheath and that our cells and our molecules actually begin to carry more light than the average human body. And we are less and less like the point of origin in the physical universe of the Homo sapiens of this planet, and more and more like our etheric selves. Many people in the world today, then, have come to the realization that living in that etheric vibration within a physical body demands that we change many things. 
our lifestyle, and our eating habits. We become more aware of our chakras, more spiritually sensitive to the pollutions of the world, and to the vibrations of animal substances and lower vibrating foods that many people take in. The more sensitive we become, the more we realize we cannot partake of things we used to partake of. And that follows suit in many areas of life. What I learned, therefore, about the study of Christian science is that the denial of matter is actually a very dangerous state of consciousness. Because not only does it deny the physical bodies we are wearing and this existence, but it denies the elementals and it denies the body elementals. The means of metaphysical healing is to declare that such and such of a sickness is not real. And in that declaration, using the power of prayer and the power of God, because we have free will and in understanding the Ascended Master's teachings, it actually works. So you can deny that such and such condition in the body exists and it can disappear. And so people who are in these metaphysical paths that have been offshoots of Christian science, such as Unity School, have great success at healing. I pointed this out to Mark as well as to El Moria when I became their student. And I asked them to give me the teaching because I was certain that they were correct, but I didn't quite understand what happens in a Christian science healing. So they explained to me that this denial pushes the karma of that condition back into the astral body or the mental body or the etheric body and it denies the body's resolution of that problem that began somewhere on another level by the karma of this or that particular discordant vibration. And so they explain that sooner or later that particular disease would have to come out and manifest for the expiation of the karma and the cleansing of the organ. And there are uh, metaphysicians that are so studious about this that they will deny disease to the end of a lifetime and reincarnate only to have to face that again. So I began to realize that the mere denial of human sickness did not really heal human sickness, but it might heal the effect of it. So the masters taught me to start looking at causes. And so as I had had a very early childhood desire to become a Christian science practitioner for healing, I came to the realization that I had to accept Moria's admonishment that the best healer in the universe is the violet flame and that I would have to get to the cause and core of these finer bodies for those conditions that would create the propensity or the weakness to inherit certain conditions genetically or to outpicture certain conditions karmically. So we inherit our own karmic emotional momentums and we outpicture these and these affect our organs and so forth. Now there is a, a karma of wrong eating, and wrong eating brings our body down, and therefore the body becomes sick. So the karma of the misuse of energy in eating and what we take in is a very serious one. So there is karma from within, and there is karma from without. What we put into the mouth creates karma. What comes out of our mouths creates karma. So in the process of becoming a messenger and being trained, I became more and more aware of the fact that lighter foods were the case. And turning to grains, vegetables, and uh, becoming a vegetarian, and then looking into various systems, being introduced to macrobiotics by a, a very fanatical person uh, who uh, tried to put this particular diet onto our community with absolutely no leeway or understanding. I've come to realize that uh, those who first introduced this diet in America now admit that they were very fanatical in the beginning and that people suffered dire consequences and that the Western bodies were not so easily adaptable as those of the Japanese to this system. So because of that fanaticism, the diet became suspect and people were not able to adhere to it and so it was rejected, unfortunately, at that time, which was in the early 70s. So we went on to California and there contacted the various systems and of course that brought us ultimately to a knowledge of fasting and to the knowledge of the raw food and the vegetable juices and the fruits and the cleansing and so forth. So I think the acme of that system is expressed by Ann Wigmore 
in her discoveries of wheatgrass and her raw foods. And so we thought that if our bodies were pure enough, we would be able to live a very balanced existence on these foods, which was our pursuit. We never left off of the grains, and we always uh, served uh, other kinds of foods, and, uh, such as fish or meats or fowl. From time to time, we did not serve these, then we served them again, uh, as everyone was trying to find his particular individual niche on this path. So in all of these various diets that were proposed, and as the spiritual development came along with it, I would put myself in the position of being the guinea pig because I couldn't recommend to anyone else what I didn't try because it might not be good for them. Well, amazingly, it didn't matter what diet I tried, I would do well on it. And so uh, <laughs> I was a good example of most diets to all of you, uh, as well as the raw food diet. Uh, on those raw foods, um, I was never able to be totally 100% on the number one diet except for periods of cleansing and always felt the need to balance it with some fish or some type of protein or some kind of substances. But in any case, having the strong constitution that I am blessed with, I was not a person that would so easily detect the weaknesses in these systems. Also because my natural inner inclinations would bring me somehow or another into balance. In other words, I would eat things that would bring me into balance, whether or not my mind intellectually disagreed with them. Uh, I followed not necessarily my heart, but perhaps my stomach, and I said, I know I have to have this food, so I would eat it. So what I came upon is a very interesting thing, is that for all of these years since I have been serving, I have had ultimate and unlimited strength and energy to serve and to do what I felt had to be done. But I came to the realization of the level of the mission that I had entered, especially in the last two years. And I realized that in the level of my office and the new dimensions and the dispensations that were upon me, I had reached a level of challenge in my spiritual service as a messenger where I did not feel that I had the physical strength to fulfill what God had called me to do. And it was the first time in my life I had ever had that realization that my physical body was not coming along with me on this vast challenge that lay before me. And so I said to myself, I am ready for the diet of the Eastern Adepts. And I called to St. Germain and I said, this is your body and it has to be fit for your service. Send me a cook who can cook me the diet of the Eastern Adepts. I made this great call and I cast myself on the rock of Christ and I said, here I am, Lord. I must do the work, you must help me. And I think all of you know that when I make up my mind that something has to be done, I get very determined in my calls. You always remember the story about me going up on the roof in Boston and calling for St. Germain. Well, this was the kind of a call it was. So for some years, some of our students in Holland had been trying to get me to try the macrobiotic diet. So they wrote again and I said, well, if we're going to have this diet in the community, you'll just have to come here and cook for me so that I can experiment and try it all out on me because I can't give the community something that I haven't experimented with. So they agreed to do this and so we have a very lovely sisters and brothers who have come to us uh, to show us the path that was brought to the United States to the West by George Oshawa, by Michio and Aveline Kushi. These are people from Japan who took their understanding from the Yellow Emperor, none other than our beloved Lord Lanto. So truly, the diet of the Eastern Adepts had come to the community. But the community didn't know it because I was determined to do this without burdening the community. So now that I have been doing this since August, and I have come to a truly deep realization of just how powerful and how energy releasing this diet is, I would like to give you an understanding of the basic principles of it and tell you from my heart that I believe that when you come to the place where you are no longer satisfied with the human animal in all of its uh, miraculous form, when you are no longer able to achieve through that body we have inherited the transcendency of your mission, that there is a diet waiting for you. 
And just as Maitreya said on the first Palm Sunday that we were here, to all of the people who were not here, who were in Los Angeles and elsewhere, he made the statement to the effect that the messenger needed to be in this place for the protection of the aura of Maitreya and the service and the vastness of the land and the high altitude and the purity of the atmosphere. And he said that every single keeper of the flame and Sheila would come to the place where they could not live anywhere else but at the inner retreat. And it was a most astounding statement because the place is prepared before you have called, I have answered. And this is the great gift of God always to his own, especially when we are so sincere about serving him as each and every one of you is. So here is the diet. No one is asking you to go on it, but it is served here and it is going to be taught at Summit University and it will be the diet that is used for cleansing. Obviously, when we were living in California in a semi-tropical climate, a very southerly place, we could tolerate more of the yin foods, the fruits, the papayas, and so forth because of the perpetual heat. But when you are in such a cold, cold climate, such a diet is not suitable for cleansing, and cleansing is a part of Summit University. So you're going to come to understand just how cleansing a macrobiotic diet can be. So I would like to present this teaching to you in this hour with all of my heart's love and with my gratitude for our students who have brought it here, for those who have brought it to America, whom I've named, and for Sanat Kumara, the great ancient of days, who actually gave this diet to the light bearers and the sons of God on earth. This is my understanding of it. There is a profound study, a lifetime's worth of study in this diet, but it is the basic principles that come down to us. And the application of those principles is a very individual matter, yet it follows a very basic mathematical formula that has to do with the science that we've taught so many, many years, the science of the yin and the yang, the balance of all forces, and that our bodies must be in that balance in order to be in tune with the infinite. These principles then come from ancient Chinese medicine. Macrobiotics is based on the oldest known book on medicine in the world. It's called the Nei Jing. You are welcome to take notes. The Nei Jing is spelled N-E-I-C-H-I-N-G. Its title is The Yellow Emperor's Classic of Internal Medicine. It is thought to have been written about 500 BC. It deals with anatomy and the causes, diagnoses, and treatments of diseases. In the 17th century, the Japanese Aikun Kaibara, one of the outstanding figures in the Neo-Confucian school, brought the ancient understanding of classical Chinese learning to the fore again. He spoke at length on the importance of the relationship of food and health. Quoting an ancient sage of China, Kaibara said, Calamity arises from what we say, and illness comes in through the mouth. Now this is coming full circle from the point of the denial of matter, the denial of disease, and the denial of the body. That's a very dangerous framework to be in because you're denying the vessel of the Blessed Mother. Your temple is the Divine Mother, and you are intended to be the Divine Mother in form. Therefore, the chemistry and the biochemistry of the body is only a reflection of the higher realities of the same alpha and omega polarity that you will find in your Ascended Master light body in the hour of your ascension. It is simply a translation into denser matter of what we know and experience in the higher octaves, bodies suited for the journey to the far country. The principles upon which macrobiotics is based can be traced to the teachings of Sagan Ishizuka. 1850 to 1910, and to George Oshawa, 1893 to 1966, who brought macrobiotics to the West. It was Oshawa who applied the term macrobiotics to this ancient teaching, 
taking from the words macro, meaning big, and biotics, meaning concerning life in the Greek. Thus, the greater or totality of life. The term was used by Oshawa to contain his understanding of the big view of life. So macrobiotics is not just a diet, it is an understanding of the transformation of energy from the spirit to the matter universe and back again. In reality, this is what Gautama Buddha was talking to us about on New Year's Eve. The great translucent, great spherical crystal sphere above and the earth sphere below. This is a study in the energy of Alpha and Omega, the Yang and the Yin. The Yang is the centripetal, gathering, contracting force. Remember Ezekiel? He saw it as the fire enfolding itself, not going out but turning within. The Yin is the centrifugal, expanding force. In the Yellow Emperor's classic of internal medicine, the transformation of energy from yin to yang and back to yin is seen in five stages. First in fire, the most yin, the most expanded stage. Then in earth, or what they call soil, the stage of condensation, gathering, the downward energy. Then a stage which is called metal, the most yang, the most tight, contracted stage then water, which is the beginning of movement and expansion, and then the tree, which can correspond to air as the branches are in the air, the upward expansive stage returning to fire. With this stage, the circle is closed. Every organ in our body has its own characteristics according to the stage of energy by which it is created and the energy that flows through it. These characteristics are expressed physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. I would like to read to you a fuller definition of those five stages so you can really feel what are these five elements. I'm reading from the book Macrobiotics and Human Behavior by William Tara. It has a foreword by Michio Kushi. William Tara is associated with that institute in Boston and lives in Alston, Massachusetts. Here he gives the images of these five, the image of soil. Soil energy can be seen as the first stage of the centripetal or yang ising process. It is energy which is settling or falling toward a center. As such, it contains the potential for everything material, mater. The components for matter are all there, but in what could be described as the soft state. At this stage of yang, certain malleable qualities are present. The image of the forest floor, where all matter is decomposed and broken down into its constituents, is one that is often used. The top of the soil is soft and decaying and rich in life and activity. As it settles deeper, it becomes more concentrated and firm. This settling process leads to the next stage of transformation called metal. Now we consider the image of metal. The metal stage is the most completely young of the five stages. It is condensation at the highest degree. This is the stage of complete materialization where energy is most compact and tightly composed. An image often associated with this is the image of ore or stone just like these amethyst crystals. Because of the level of concentration described in this stage of transformation, there is a strong quality of energetic potential, energy in potential waiting to be released. Energy which reaches the ultimate stage of contraction seeks release and movement. Having reached the extremes of one pole, the tendency is then to return to the opposite. So we come then to the image of water. The tension created by the energetic transformation into metal finds its release in the water stage. This stage describes the first energetic tendency of a movement toward yin or expansion. 
The image of water indicates more viscous qualities inherent in the beginnings of this movement. Water is the stage of energetic release and is fluid in its movement. When you make tea, you are using water to release the concentration of elements in a vegetable matter. Rain falls upon the earth and flows into the lakes, rivers, and streams, moving continually toward the sea, where it evaporates and ascends back to the atmosphere in a never-ending cycle towards and then away from the earth. Water, then, is the means for the breaking down of soil and metal and releasing its energetic potential. The image of tree, the movement of water in its stage of evaporation, is closely aligned with the energetic qualities described in tree energy. Tree energy describes ki, which is ascending, the impulse behind the growth of plants upward and toward the sun, the rising energy of morning mists and any movement up and away from the surface of the planet. This energy is a further progression of yin, or expansive tendencies of water. But it is more controlled or channeled. It has a more defined direction of movement, whereas the water phase of energy is more formless and multidirectional. The ascendancy of tree energy moves with what could be called a directness of purpose, in a more ordered and defined fashion. Just as a sprouting seed moves toward the sun, so does tree energy move toward fire. Air moves toward fire. The image of fire is analogous to the sun itself. It is the plasmic and fiery energy of combustion. The great transformation between the yin and yang phases of the energetic cycle it produces warmth which radiates out from itself but consumes and diminishes its very substance. Fire energy encompasses the most extreme polarities and qualities of all the stages of transformation. It manifests extreme yin in its radiant powers which can then begin the slow condensation back into soil reducing energy to its refined basis but it also contains within it the young qualities of condensation and breaking down that which it consumes. So the physical fire makes us think of the sacred fire which is in the balance of yin and yang. Now Tara goes on to say here that each phase of development in this transformation cycle is essential to the next. We are always in the state of becoming and through the year we go through our cycles material and spiritual. We are always in movement. We are a dynamic form of this process of transformation. You can liken these five to the qualities of the five secret rays that we find from the 7 to the 11 o'clock line. The effectiveness of energy to manifest itself in each successive phase is dependent upon how effectively the energy has moved to the full potential in the one preceding. In order for there to be a complete condensation of yang energy in metal, there must be an adequate resource of soil. In order for the potential to be released into the questing qualities of water, metal must have consolidated its resources to the maximum. In order for tree energy to have the upward lift and lightness that is its potential, there must be the characteristic motion and potential for movement that finds its base in water. In order for fire to complete its radiant transformation, it must be fed adequately by the rising energy of tree. This energetic cycle is not then a series of unrelated phenomena, but is a continuum of change looping back on itself in an endless drama of materialization and diffusion. We might say materialization through etherealization. Now we can see that these sequences of transformation come under the law of karma because karma are causes creating effects. Each change is an effect of the previous cause. So cause effect sequences in our bodies through these five cycles, one follows the next. 
as the impetus goes, so we experience the fullness, the quintessence of the phase we are going through. If we don't understand the cycles, or the foods, or the activity, or the state of consciousness that is necessary to experience them in the greatest bliss, then we are not truly living the fullness of life that God intended us on earth. I think many people who have the otherworldly consciousness, they're always living for the day when they get to heaven, are those whose bodies don't afford them a chalice to really experience the zest and joy of living wherever you happen to be in whatever octave. So Tara goes on to say, in the medicine of the Far East, the various organ systems and functions of the body are seen to be animated with varying degrees of influence by this cycle of transformation. Each stage of transformation has biological, emotional, and spiritual qualities animated by these energetic transformations. If the various stages of transformation are allowed to complete themselves, are allowed to complete themselves, that's our free will. The individual's capacity for maintaining a healthy existence is enhanced. If, however, the energies are blocked, stagnated, or if any particular phase becomes overly excited, then the effect of the energies becomes perverse, producing disharmony, tension, or confusion. This theory establishes a direct relationship between those biochemical and energetic events occurring within the physical body and their corresponding effect on our abilities to perceive and act effectively. That word effectively ought to be considered. When do you feel that you are effective, as effective as you know you need to be, as you have the potential to be? It's when you achieve the ultimate goals that you have in life and achieve them on a daily basis. Now, I was telling you that I was sensing that I was not being as effective as my mantle and mission called me to be, and I was determined to do something about it, and I knew St. Germain had the key. It points to the direct relationship between blood quality and brain function which also provides for our evolving understanding of the basic energetic qualities which underlie our material world. Oriental medicine and diagnosis provide a clear understanding of the connection between human behavior and physical health, an approach both comprehensive and sophisticated in its understanding of the human condition. Oriental diagnosis differs from the conventional Western method in both intent and application. It is not simply a method of classifying symptoms once they have presented themselves, but is more accurately a tool for seeing the onset of potential problems far in advance of their becoming serious. The basic premise of the Oriental approach to diagnosis is that everything involved in human behavior is a reflection of internal processes and an accurate barometer of the level of biological integrity the integration of all systems, organs, and the ultimate integration of those systems through the heart chakra, the threefold flame, all of the chakras, the rising kundalini. The ways that we walk and speak, our posture and handwriting, and everything that we do are seen as extensions of our overall state of well-being. It is in this sense a truly holistic approach to understanding the human condition. It is also the most human approach to understanding human health, since individuals are not forced to wait for the pain and discomfort of extreme symptoms before realizing that they are ill. Now, unless each individual organ of our bodies is functioning at 100% efficiency, we are in the process of becoming more and more diseased. Many people are simply satisfied with a 60% effective liver, a 50% effective kidneys, as long as they're still walking around. But we don't have to be satisfied with anything less than the full God-given eternal youth within our organs that we were intended to have. We are descendants of Noah. We've come down from the ancients. We've lived in spiritual communities. We have eaten this way. This is our diet. It's the lost teaching found again. It's the essential element that we need 
to carry and sustain light. Every organ in your body is reflective of a certain ray or the secret rays and is an instrument of one or more of the chakras. Every organ is a chalice. Every cell in that organ is a chalice. Every molecule is a chalice. We have organs then that can be instruments of our causal body on earth. If they are sustained and nourished and cleansed simultaneously, we will see how much more light we can hold and hold in balance. I think the masters have longed for a long time to see our chila ship come to the place where we can sustain in our bodies the greater light that they give us so that there's an ongoing mastery and attainment that is building on itself step by step and day by day. According to macrobiotics, we have five pairs of organs in our body relating to the five transformations of energy. Every pair consists of a yin, more hollow organ, and a yang, more compact organ. These two organs work very closely together. When one of these organs gets weaker, the other does too. These five pairs of organs can be listed. And as we tackle the path of perfect health, spiritually and physically, we need to see these as a yin and yang, an alpha and omega, as twin flames attempting to perform in our bodies the cosmic dance of Shiva. And they are partners in this dance, and they must be in time and in step together. It's a very exciting experience to realize that these organs have a consciousness. If you believe a rock has a consciousness, surely you believe your liver has a consciousness, right? <laughs> and so if one is out of step, well, the other one is going to trip too. Yin and yang go together, and when they are solidly locked together, you have that strength and inner sense of well-being. So it's well to make a list of these and to look at how they interact. You have the spleen and the pancreas together with the stomach. These are created by the earth or soil energy, and that is the transformation stage they relate to, the spleen and pancreas with stomach. The lungs are in polarity with a large intestine created by metal energy. Kidneys are in polarity with the bladder and reproductive organs created by water energy. The liver is in polarity with a gallbladder, created by tree energy. The heart is in polarity with a small intestine, created by fire energy. I think it's very important that we review the relationship of human behavior with the state of health of each of these physical organs and of how they relate in pairs. This is an amazing study and an enlightenment in itself. If you haven't yet studied this, you will feel your consciousness simply expand into a new awareness of yourself. Since we are so keen as chilas of the brotherhood to be in God control of our minds, our emotions, our physical body, and our memory. And then we observe ourselves not exercising the God control or the God mastery that we desire. No matter how much we try, no matter how much we decree, no matter how much we study. So we say to ourselves, I must be a terrible person. I can't overcome this terrible habit. And it keeps on happening no matter what I do. We come to the realization that the reason for this is that certain organs in your body pertain to certain levels of the emotional body, the mental, the etheric, and ultimately the physical. And if they cannot be a chalice for the balance of alpha and omega in that particular area of your life, you will not be able to hold the energy in your temple here below to have God control in that phase of your existence, no matter how hard you try. Because the body is the temple, the temple of the living God. That means every single part of it and every part of God we are intended to express has a particular little chalice, a particular mug, a place that God pours that particular light and frequency 
for your experience here below. So let's look at this. This teaching is coming from William Tara's book that I've just shown you, Macrobiotics and Human Behavior. He studied with Michio Kushi, who, as you know, is one of the foremost teachers of macrobiotics in America, and he himself was a student of George Oshawa. So the teaching set forth, which again all comes down to us from the yellow emperor who got it directly from the heart of Sanat Kumara. There can be a balance or an imbalance in the spleen, pancreas, and stomach. This, remember, is the earth or soil energy. When the spleen, pancreas, and stomach are strong and healthy, they represent the capacity to be on the earth or grounded. It involves not only stability, but also resourcefulness, the capacity of steady perseverance. There is the capacity for compassion, thoughtful consideration, self-reliance, and a feeling that the individual can maintain a steady sense of direction in life. The feeling of internal resourcefulness makes it possible for that one to be generous in giving to others, since they have no internal doubt as to their own capacities. So if you have some of these very positive qualities, you know that you have at least somewhat of a healthy spleen, pancreas, and stomach. When the energy of these organs is blocked or becomes stagnated, these qualities have a tendency to turn back on themselves and produce negative thinking and destructive behavior. The early characteristics of an imbalance in the energies of the spleen, pancreas, and stomach are a growing sense of emotionally self-indulgent feelings of self-pity and defeat. Now, if you have a weakness in these organs, then you will be subject to the astrological configurations, the full moon, and those particular signs that have to do with these negative qualities. Self-pity and defeatism fall on the six o'clock line. We're in the full moon of cancer on that line. People feel that they quite simply cannot cope with any demands placed upon them. They still have aspirations and dreams, but are lacking in the energy to fulfill them. They become easily locked into the cycle of failure. In an attempt to redress this imbalance, they seek energy from others. Instead of giving compassion as in a healthy state, they seek compassion. They complain increasingly about their state of health, the incapacity of others to fulfill their needs, and the insensitivity of the world at large. Their self-image is often that of the victim. Whoever wrote the song, Sometimes I Feel Like a Motherless Child, must have had problems with his spleen, his spleen, <laughs> pancreas, and stomach. <laughs> it is important for individuals with this imbalance to be aware that their tendency to make harsh judgments of others and to be suspicious of their intentions, and also their feeling that they have to measure their energy instead of giving it freely, is promoted largely by their own condition, and specifically that condition the spleen, pancreas, and stomach. Now when we know that and we learn the foods that can be healing and how to cleanse and heal these organs, we will notice that we begin to be more upbeat, that we don't ever think about ourselves as a motherless child in self-pity, and we don't have the reaction to that in criticism of others who somehow fail to meet our emotional and physical needs. You know, this is one of the biggest problems of divorce in America today. Ultimate expectations of fulfillment of needs by the other partner. And so Americans who are perpetually adolescents always expect that everything that they want is going to be fulfilled in their partner. And of course, uh, there is that problem with the American diet in these organs and in others. Now in their relationships with other persons with this problem, they are apt to be frustrated. Since they are continually seeking reassurance, Tara says, other people become increasingly impatient with their demands and ultimately try to avoid contact with them. Since they sincerely desire warmth and close contact with others, this can produce in them feelings of suspicion and cynicism. They are prone to falling into the view that everyone is hypocritical. Extreme imbalance in the spleen, pancreas, stomach 
can produce feelings of jealousy and martyrdom. These feelings are not based on any conscious process or attempt toward the manipulation of others. The individuals are simply seeking some way to fill what they feel is a growing need. And in fact, these three organs are crying out for wholeness. They are in a state of imbalance caused by the diet. That may be accelerated and intensified by karma that has to do with that particular vibration and ray. And of course, eating poorly and causing the problem again can be one of these circles that comes from a previous lifetime of falling into the trap of one's karma of states of consciousness uh, that are self-producing. So when you think about this, that the unhealthy organs produce the cynicism, the cynicism in turn produces a state of consciousness inherited whereby you can inherit in the genes a weakness in your constitution in these organs. So it gets to be which came first, the chicken or the egg. And since this cycle keeps going, you can see that it now has become a perversion of the true five stages of transformation that we should be going through. And we know from the Master's teachings that we inherit karmically the conditions of our bodies. We take them on from our parents. We're attracted to people of the same state of absence of wholeness or of the fullness of wholeness. And so when we are whole spiritually, we attract whole people spiritually. When we're whole physically, we also attract people who are whole physically. Unconsciously, the individuals may even place themselves in difficult situations that are sure to elicit the sympathy and or pity of others. They will continually make the same mistakes or put themselves in situations where difficult outcomes are predictable to all those who know them. The nurturing, receptive, and stabilizing qualities of a healthy pancreas, spleen, and stomach are strong influences on a woman's physical ability to carry children and her capacity to nurture them emotionally. If this energy is depleted through dysfunction of the spleen, pancreas, and stomach, these stabilizing influences are lost. This imbalance will provide feelings of suspicion, jealousy, or insecurity, and can prevent a mother from giving her children the love and care they need. It can contribute to sexual frigidity. Speaking of foods that give imbalances in the spleen, pancreas, and stomach, William Tara explains that the spleen, pancreas, and stomach are adversely affected by the excessive consumption of simple or refined sugars, fruits and fruit juices, oily and fatty foods, heavy foods such as baked and fried foods, pastas, etc. It is beneficial for persons with these imbalances to engage in work which involves cooperation with many people and the maximum amount of social interaction. It is important that the person not become stuck in overanalyzing his own problems or isolate himself from close companionship. That is the conclusion of this discussion of those three organs. Later we will take up what are the foods that are needed for it. We take now the lungs and the large intestine formed by the metal energy and the balance and imbalance thereof. William Tara says that when the lungs and large intestine are strong and healthy, the individual display the capacity to consolidate experience, to develop self-discipline and practicality, to gain comfort, happiness, and security, and to maintain a generally positive demeanor in his approach to life. The characteristics displayed with this imbalance in the lungs and large intestines are indecisiveness, feeling of lethargy, ultimately depression. When you get depressed because your chakras are depressed and your organ is depressed because it is not in balance, now it is not a chalice for divine harmony, but it carries the vibration where you will attract to yourself entities of depression or depressa. And therefore, in this absence of wholeness, whatever state or vibration the organs are in, you will attract those kinds of entities that you can find on your entity list. So you see, you're never alone when you're depressed, even though it may have started with what you ate last night. 
And the same thing is indecisiveness and lethargy. You start getting these very lugubrious beasts of consciousness that just weigh upon you and you think that tons of energy is sitting upon you. And here it is simply what you did or did not eat to sustain the lungs and large intestine which could have given you a sound physical base for a very high spiritual vibration that could be sustained through the living organic pulsation of that organ. And through those organs comes the light of the chakras that are closest to them. In the unbalanced state, the individual seems unable to cope with even the most minor situations or problems. They often seem frozen or incapacitated, lacking the ability to move beyond adversity. That frozen quality is the quality of the metal energy when it is ultimately solid. When confronted with difficulty, they are unable to see positive pathways through or around the issue at hand. This confusion of thought leads them increasingly to believe that there is nothing to be done. You can't get there from here, they are convinced. The individuals are more apt to feel that their inability to act is something wrong with them. They often feel that they are in the way of others and may even feel slightly embarrassed concerning their indecision. Well, we know indecision is also a condition of a full moon in Cancer, the six o'clock line. And so this is a problem of our manifesting the mother light. And so it's not necessarily a condition of karma or a condition of our spirit or our soul, but a condition that we are in because the body weighs very heavily in our state of consciousness. The body has a strong consciousness. Your elemental has a strong consciousness and the organs all put together constitute a part of your daily physical awareness. How you feel, how you think, how you sense you are, and who you sense you are. In the later stages of this progressive development, individuals become increasingly locked within themselves. They become disinterested in what goes on around them, motivated by their seeming inability to affect events. They become unresponsive, indifferent, and negative. There is often a dulling of character, loss of physical stability, and general disinterest in others. The body language evident when energy is inhibited is characterized by its absence. There is little or no gesturing. Hands are often stuffed in pockets, hang at the sides of the body, or allowed to lay lifelessly in the lap. There is a pulling down and forward in the shoulder areas, producing a kind of slouch which is accompanied by a jutting forward of the head. The individuals do look as if the weight of the world is on their shoulders. The voice has a tendency to have a slightly monotonous quality or drone. Because of their lack of animation in gesture and speech, others have a tendency to ignore them, which fulfills their expectation of being unimportant and ineffective. <laughs> we should have a cartoonist here drawing these figures. <laughs> The general complexion tends to be very pale and often chalky, especially the cheeks. These individuals, now this is the lungs and the large intestines, these individuals often seem lost in their own thoughts and may attempt to engage themselves increasingly in activities not requiring the cooperation of or interaction with others. Depending upon their relative vitality, they may become protective of themselves and their possessions. Writing of foods that give imbalances in the lungs and large intestines. William Tara says, the lungs and large intestine are most directly and adversely affected by the overconsumption of fluids. Too much fluid of any kind. Watery fruits or softer liquid dairy foods such as milk and yogurt. The depressive tendencies exhibited by people who have problems with the lungs also can benefit from forms of exercise which promote complete oxygenation. Any activity which focuses on breath control, breathing exercises, etc., can be helpful. It is important for individuals with tendencies to depression to maintain active social lives and to involve themselves in creative activities with others in their free time. It is also important for them to establish friendships with people whose judgment they trust and who are positive and forthcoming in their attitudes. The social environment for the potential depressive is of extreme importance and must be one containing a high level of enthusiasm and care. Communication is of the greatest importance. Now, 
once one realizes that various bouts of depression are connected with a not so healthy large intestine and pair of lungs, and one begins on a course of diet to correct this, one does not change overnight, although immediate signs of improvement are definitely apparent when you stop eating the most uh, deadly of substances that are affecting us, which I believe to be uh, dairy products, red meats, and salt, and sugar, uh, excessive salt. So in that period when we know why we are experiencing this depression or this, this, or this, that, it's important to have group reinforcement and a great compassion for one another and to lend our body parts in a sense of support where we are not depressed because we may be healthy in that state, we may have another dysfunction. And so we give support and reinforcement and reinsurance. And as I have been around such people uh, in recent months, I have known that repeatedly and over and over again, there is a necessity of a continual reassurance. You can do it, you can make it, uh, you know, you are not this terrible person, and, and always with words, with enlightenment, and with good food supplied, pick people up out of that down-feeling state. And so we have to do that with ourselves and with one another. And so if we all decide to try this together, we can all go through the various stages of overcoming. Now we come to the bladder and the kidneys. The balance and imbalance in the bladder and the kidneys. When the kidneys and the bladder are healthy and functioning properly, the positive characteristics are adventurous, curious and courageous qualities, a strong confidence, and the will toward movement. Like water, the energy spreads in all directions and is adaptable. It sparks changes in all that it touches and is relentless in its motion. The energy itself manifests in the impulse or will toward movement in the individual, the capacities to extend our perimeters and to explore the world around us. It is the mode of force behind adventure, and that adventurous spirit takes you beyond this octave to the retreats of the Great White Brotherhood because you get that spring and impetus from the body which is just like a trampoline. You can have that sense of bounce and movement until you're right into the higher octaves as you leave your body at night and go with your angels. When you're so heavy that you cannot even think that there's another place that you could be, uh, it's kind of hard to imagine yourself taking flight. <laughs> Especially if you're a stuffed duck after eating heavily <laughs> and then you climb in bed. <laughs> you're not exactly going to feel adventurous. When an imbalance manifests in the bladder and kidneys, or the water energy, this desire to move out from ourselves is inhibited, and we become tentative in our exploration. With disharmony in this energy, the characteristic behavior is, according to William Tara, anxiety, lack of self-confidence, doubt, fear, and paranoia, and lack of will to accept new challenges. This is the affliction on the line of Pisces. Fear and doubt, absence of self-confidence, anxiety. This hits us on the Virgo line, the Pisces-Virgo axis. Individuals often feel that the environment is filled with threats to them, that they are vulnerable and exposed. Their behavior seems overly cautious and self-protective. In its first stage of development, the feelings of anxiety and vulnerability may be more generalized, but if the condition is allowed to progress, there is usually an identification of something external as being causal. In other words, different phobias can appear. So our diet is affecting our mental health, our psychological health. But the persons feel that something can be done to allay their discomfort. They expend energy more positively in terms of protecting themselves against their imaginary adversaries. Since their fear is often ill-disguised, they lay themselves open to attack, often actually attracting aggression because of their seeming instability and weakness. Instability, or out of alignment dukkha state, also attracts accidents as well as attacks. 
And so when you are out of alignment because of too much sugar, you are really vulnerable to accidents. You can see it in children so easily how they eat and then how they are in control or not in control of their bodies, how they bump into things, how they get bruised, how they fall down and so forth. Their body language is also characterized by protective gestures. They tend to be nervous when surrounded by either open space or by individuals. They prefer to literally have their backs to the wall. Maybe they're the perpetual wallflowers. <laughs> if only they knew it wasn't their face and acne, it was their bladder and kidneys. <laughs> <laughs> They like to see everything that is going on so there will be no surprises. They do not like to be taken unaware. They may seem agitated or anxious with quick movements and sudden starts. Quite commonly there is a flitting of the eyes from side to side, a constant surveying, protective in nature, of the space around them. How many of you remember people that just are constantly <laughs> darting like this with their eyes? <laughs> we had someone around one time that never stopped doing that. He didn't know it was his bladder and kidneys either. <laughs> Foods that cause imbalance in the bladder and kidneys. William Tara says that the kidneys are especially vulnerable to abuse through consumption of cold foods or drinks, such as ice cream, cold soda, cold alcoholic beverages, especially where the cold food has a high concentration of sugar. Other foods which have an extreme yin nature, such as tropical fruits, Members of the nightshade family, spinach and yin vegetables can also produce stress. If you don't live in the tropics, you shouldn't be eating tropical fruits. Now there's an all-American habit of ice water. So you go in a restaurant and you say to the waiter, oh, no ice please. So he takes the same picture that is totally cold and he just holds back the ice and pours you a glass of water without ice that is freezing. So you put it next to the candle that's burning on the table <laughs> and you wait for this ice cold water to uh, warm up a little bit. But it's really a deadly thing to take in is this ice water, especially before you're going to eat your meal. You should absolutely not partake of it. For individuals suffering from the emotional disturbance of fear, it is important that the body be kept warm, especially the area directly over the kidneys. Ever see people wearing hot water bottles on their kidneys? People with bladder kidney problems should start to encourage friendships with people who are warm and compassionate. <laughs> you watch people who start warming up to you now. <laughs> It is also important for the individual to select clearly defined projects in his life which he knows can be successfully accomplished and to pursue them to completion. Balance and imbalance in the liver and gallbladder. This is the tree energy. The manifestation of a healthy liver and gallbladder is the orderly progression of growth and development. Its positive attributes in human character are patience, orderliness, thoughtfulness, endurance, and a general light-heartedness. I would call those virtues grace. Grace is a very important counterpart to the liver because the liver, as Moria has taught us, is the place of live records. That's where the records of your karma are stored. The liver is an extremely important organ and either we are manifesting the bitter fruits of karma because the liver is toxic or we are dealing with the karmic records in the liver by grace because we have a healthy liver. Now isn't this grace? Isn't somebody gracious who is patient, orderly, thoughtful, enduring, therefore capable of enduring friendships, and generally light-hearted? This individual has a strong driving force towards accomplishment, ideas, and social creativity. The liver is a very large organ. If you have a sick liver, you know, a major part of you is not contributing to the élan, to the victory of life and to the joie de vivre. If this energy is diminished within us, these positive qualities turn back on themselves with unpleasant consequences. Imbalance produces impatient and rigid behavior and is the breeding ground of anger, aggression, violence. 
The energy released at this phase can be overwhelming for the individual who suffers from this imbalance. Anyone who has ever been the victim of intense anger, aggression, or violence knows that the person who is seized with that energy is totally out of control. That is an extreme state of the liver being toxic, out of alignment, and not nourished. There is a strong tendency to over-control, which is manifested in their physical and emotional behavior. The energy itself seeks release and creates a bottled-up feeling within the individual. There is a strong effect on the interpretation of sensory information. Often there is a feeling that things are out of harmony outside of oneself. Now, those of you who are psychologists, psychiatrists in our midst, counselors, you begin to realize that you can do counseling for five years. And I've talked to many of you, and you've told me how very little progress is made uh, through these sessions. But people, of course, do improve. But it's a long bout when you go through therapy uh, to get rid of these situations. And so it seems to me the greatest psychologists and counselors, as well as in the spiritual field, would recognize that if people are given the proper diet, along with counseling and support that is needed in going through that cleansing, what wonders can be achieved through the understanding that the proper balance of alpha and omega in that organ must be reestablished for the permanent progress on the path. Imbalances in the liver and gallbladder produce the most defensive and aggressive types of body language. The key word is over control. This is particularly evident in the muscles of the jaw and neck, where the teeth will be clenched and the neck muscles rigid. There's a tendency for these persons to hold themselves very erect. And one of the most common gestures is crossing the arms over the chest or lower rib cage with fists clenched. Now, as I look back on all of the years that I've seen individuals pass through this organization, I can see very clearly from my perspective that some individuals simply could not make it because of a condition in one or more of their organs. And this one we're talking about is definitely one of these. That force of anger that they could not contain. To be able to offer someone so simple as a balanced diet to deal with the most challenging of forces that pass through us from time to time. I mean, I'm sure you've had relatives and friends and people you've seen throughout your life that were afflicted with such conditions and never got out of them. And it's the people that cross the line and get into the level of nervous breakdowns and they cannot adapt in society that are in all of our mental institutions. So a revolution in health comes through the understanding of balance. The people who are very healthy and hardy with great constitutions, they don't have so much of a need to experiment with this diet. And we have a certain tolerance within ourselves of human imperfection and imperfection in human behavior. And we always think, well, we're, we're pretty much in control, so we're OK. Concerning the liver and gallbladder problems. In communication, individuals with these problems have a tendency to speak loudly in order to articulate through their clenched jaws, to use sharp prodding or cutting gestures with their hands while speaking. There is little fluidity or sense of grace in their body movements. They tend to be jerky and look somewhat mechanical. The generalized irritability caused by liver gallbladder problems can easily be focused on external individuals or situations. Persons with these imbalances are often impatient and exasperated in their dealings with others. They seem to possess some internal schedule and sense of order by which others must abide. They do not like lateness or lack of organization in others. They are usually extremely inhibited in expressing their own emotions, especially those revealing any hesitation, insecurity, or weakness on their part. They feel that if they allow themselves to open up or to lose control of their energy, they would explode. Their tone of voice tends to be abrupt, and they may speak louder than necessary. 
The manifestation of problems in the liver and gallbladder can vary depending on the individual's constitution and condition. Since overcontrol is one of the primary behavioral symptoms of disorders of this nature, the person with the young constitution and or condition will have a tendency to exaggerate this control mechanism. If you're a young type of person and you have a liver gallbladder problem, this, this type of behavior will be exaggerated. So there are types. Some people are more yang people. Some people are more yin people. That's just the way their constitution is. They are not apt to display their anger, but to continually attempt to hold it in check. In the long run, this behavior is the most dangerous to the individual and to others. As the tension builds up over time, it eventually seeks release. When it is finally released, the individual may lose all control and be extremely aggressive or violent. In a person with a young constitution and or condition, constitution is what you're born with, your condition is what you make of yourself and how you happen to be in that particular time frame from what you may have recently eaten or eaten over some time. In such a person with a young constitution and or condition, the general body language can be interpreted as a warning to others not to push or prod. When angered, the individual becomes more rigid, the jaw becomes more clenched, and the voice has a tendency to drop in pitch, all of which are easily recognizable danger signs. The person with the yin constitution and or condition does not have the innate capacity to control. Consequently, they are more apt to express their frustration and to unleash their anger or to display their irritability more obviously. This expressed anger is usually less threatening to others. Often the expressed anger is ineffective in gaining the attention of others because it is not invested with physical power. The health of the liver is seen to have a strong influence on male sexuality and in its positive aspects exhibits itself in patience and tactile sensitivity. If the energy in the liver is imbalanced, the individual becomes thoughtless, impatient, and physically insensitive. The combination of these symptoms is more apt to produce aggressive sexual behavior and a more reactive, inconsiderate approach to sex, carried to the extreme, the rape and violence. Foods that can create imbalance in the liver and gallbladder, the functions of the liver and gallbladder are most commonly inhibited by the consumption of meat, poultry, eggs, cheese, animal fats, and too much salt. These produce a hardening of the liver and create physical tension and blockages in the energy flow. This process results in the insensitivity and harshness of manners mentioned above. For those with problems of this type, contact with nature is important. To walk in woods or forest lands and create the time for meditative pursuits in daily life. Next we come to balance and imbalance in the heart and small intestine. The heart and the small intestine interact. Heartburn, then, can be caused by toxins or flatulence or gas in the small intestine. People think they have heart problems and they can even get serious heart problems just because of the condition of the small intestine. These two organs are created by the fire energy. When the heart and small intestine are strong, the positive attributes are the rhythmic radiation of energy through activity and an internal calmness of spirit. Calmness of spirit. A capacity to align the rhythm of actions with the surroundings. One could say that the qualities of empathy are strong. The capacity to resonate with the rhythm and intent of others while still maintaining a deep sense of self and personal purpose. Calmness, peacefulness, adaptability, gentleness, tranquility, the capacity to control the rhythm of one's life, and a capacity for expressive communication are the positive attributes. It's an amazing thought, but if you think about this condition of being out of balance in the heart, you can see that it would not be a correct receptacle for the threefold flame. So the more out of alignment that the heart is, the farther away from the heart will the threefold flame be in vibration. It's like draw nigh to me in the alpha omega balance and I will draw nigh to you in the alpha omega balance.
The individual with imbalances in the heart and small intestine is often erratic in behavior. Goes along with an erratic pulse and heartbeat, flamboyant and exuberant, all form and little content. The heart quality is simply not there. It's not a proper vessel. A kind of extravagant or manic sense of humor is often used as a shield to deflect the attention of others away from any deep perception of the individual. The guy who's always the clown. He's making everybody laugh, but you never get to know him. And if you do, you find out that's not much left beneath the surface, but his ability to keep you laughing. The humor referred to here is often inappropriate for the situation and sometimes has a dark edge to it. It can be self-deprecating. Since the individuals are poking fun at themselves, they can easily deflect the criticism or opinions of others. There is a correspondent tendency to over-dramatize situations and to be very dramatic in their expression, which is often extremely appealing to others since the individual may appear to be extraordinarily interesting in the diversity of their character. There is often, in fact, a very charismatic quality to individuals with this imbalance, especially since they may express themselves very cleverly and can be persuasive speakers. It's getting more and more to sound like a definition of a fallen one who doesn't have a threefold flame and has developed a flamboyant personality instead of that real divine spark. The energy of the heart must be in a constant state of generation and release, generating heat and releasing heat, light, love, joy. Those who have imbalances in this energy often feel driven to discharge this energy that wells up within them. They can exhibit little or no control. Any situation having a strong emotional tone to it can trigger off this discharge. Potentially emotive events can often lead to exaggerated, impulsive behavior by making commitments that are difficult to keep or by easily being caught in the emotion of an event. The erratic nature can best be understood if we see the exaggerated behavior described above as being complemented by a wish to totally withdraw into isolation whenever the opportunity affords itself. Individuals with this imbalance often lead dramatic double lives. When they are in the presence of others, they appear jolly, good-natured, and interested in all that goes on around them. They do not, however, like others to get too close. It is difficult for them to establish close relationships with many people, although they may have passing and superficial relationships with many. Even their passionately held beliefs and flamboyant gestures have a tendency to inspire admiration, perhaps, but also hold other people at a distance. There's no really hard quality in them to get to know them. When they are by themselves, they tend to slide toward the negative, qualities of self-pity or simply an energetic limbo, where they neither reflect on themselves or others nor make any considerations concerning their actions. They only perform when there is an audience. They can be ambitious and effective, but need external pressure provided by either individuals or situations to complete tasks successfully. They often lack a deep motivation and will of their own. This is still a description to me of either a very diminished threefold flame or no threefold flame at all. With imbalance in the heart, there is often tension in the throat, which can cause the voice to move to a higher pitch when the individual becomes excited or enthusiastic about their topic. The rhythm of their speech has a tendency to be very rapid as excitement mounts. The consumption of animal fats as contained in meat, poultry, eggs, cheese, and spicier hot foods have long been linked with problems of the heart and circulatory system and should be avoided. Blockages in the energy of the heart can be reversed by establishing order and simplicity in daily life in a calm environment. Food should be simple and unembellished and more reflective habits encouraged. It is important for the individual to learn to listen to others and to try to slow down the more dramatic extremes of their existence. What is very obvious about the macrobiotic system is that it is a chalice for the great path and teachings of the Ascended Masters the violet flame, the path of the heart, and the path of individual Christhood. And we can see that 
It is the spirit that must occupy the bowl of matter. From this study, we see that our success in dealing with our own illness and in harmony plays a role in determining what happens in our lives. If we establish health on a physical level, the natural outcome will be that we will be readily able to respond appropriately to situations and exhibit behavior which produces harmony in our relationships with others. But we must have the courage and determination to change when needed. We've had a a dictation on the topic of change is the order of the day. Change is the winds of Aquarius. Change is what the Ascended Master's path is all about. It's all about people who understand they're in a process of self-transformation. And each day, they are more of reality than they were the day before. If we do not consciously work on a change in our physical problems and negative characteristics, it is possible for us to drag old attitudes and behaviors with us, which can, over time, continually undermine our best efforts toward the creation of a happy, healthy, and responsible existence. What we're really after is the recreation of ourselves. And each day as we recreate ourselves, by all of the positive forces that we have access to from the Ascended Master's teachings, supporting the chalice with balanced and pure food, we realize that more and more of God is manifesting in our temple until, as Gautama Buddha said, when you're climbing that mountain, the next step is the etheric body, the etheric octave, and the deathless solar body. And that's what the goal is. The goal is not to create perfect bodies for perfect humans to live forever in the human state, but perfect bodies that are so perfect that they slip into the great equilateral triangle of the trinity of being, things equal to each other and equal to the one, therefore, enable us to disappear from the time-space continuum. When you fulfill the equilateral triangle, you have no longer need for the body you have perfected. Because the body you have perfected is, by definition of perfection, the perfect chalice for the etheric matrix. And your soul consciousness being raised by all of the virtue that you have focused in that perfect body enters into the higher octave. I'm convinced that this is the path whereby the adepts have shown their mastery in form. And I'm very convinced that the Brotherhood will be ecstatic when each and every one of us demonstrates it. It is our responsibility to be the very best chalice that we can figure out how to be in this octave. The better example we leave, the more we are pioneers, the more we dare to go into unknown and uncharted areas, where more light can be coalesced in form, the more we are counted as the futurist, the avant-garde of the Aquarian age. We have all had to follow someone. Very few of us could come to the conclusions of this diet just out of the air. It is somewhat difficult to draw the conclusions that the masters give us in their dictations. They come from ancient wisdom and a very high and exalted evolution of thought And when we think of where we were before we knew certain things we know today that are the keys to our true liberation, we have to remember that on every ledge, every circle of the road going up the mountain, there are still people down there where we were. I was telling someone recently, every time I go back to my hometown, it seems like the whole place is unreal, that it's just a set, some kind of a set of a stage in which I played out my karma. And yet those people are very real. But they live in so much unreality that it's hard to find the reality when you go there. And you always feel you're going into the past when you go back to your hometown. But we have to remember that it isn't the past for those people. It's today for them. And a lot of them haven't gone anywhere since we left. There isn't one of you that hasn't had that experience, I know. Well, it's rather frightening. One was taken and 10,000 were left and you were plucked by the Lord, 
by some measure of grace you've earned, and surely by a lot more we haven't earned. So the joy of this liberation is the youth, the eternal youth, and the boundless spring of energy that we remember we once had, whether in this life or in higher octaves. And we know that with that boundless energy, how many more people we could reach out to. The only reason we don't reach out to people is that our strength fails us. It's not because we don't want to keep on giving and keep on teaching and keep on going out in the highway of life. It's when you come to that point where the physical strength is not there and you are prevented from doing the most joyous thing you want to do. And when that happens to you, if you are really on the path of individual Christhood, you will say, I will not be in this position. I will not remain. I don't have to grow old and die to once again know that exhilaration of boundless energy that I know I have always had. So it's out of the love of those who are today where we were 3, 5, 10, 25 years ago or embodiments ago. It's the most amazing thing to me to look in the faces of people and to to see them when they come out to stumps or see them in the streets of life and to see them after a stump meeting when they are full of light for having for five hours or more looked at that chart of the I Am Presence. Uh, They've never looked at God so long in their life. And uh, they're so filled with that light. And I look at their faces again, those very same people that just came in five hours ago. And I think to myself, what a place this world could be. And so you never want to stop when you come to that place where you have to stop. You can't stump one more night till you take a rest. And so we know the time is short and the people are out there. And how many people do we keep who come to our stumps and why don't they stay? Is one of the reasons because they're on such bad diets they can't hold the light? I'm sure it's true of many people, even when they think they're on good diets, good new age diets, because we've all been on them. Well, it's the pumpkin hour. (laughs) The other lecture I'm going to give you, I had considered titling it 1155. (laughs) (laughs) I know you've been here a long time. I'm wondering how many of you cannot stay tomorrow, despite Archangel Michael's request. Some of you have plane tickets and reasons you have to be elsewhere. I understand that. Looks like most of you can be here. How many can be here? Oh, that is so fantastic. (laughs) I'm telling you, staff, you can be here unless there's a state of emergency in your department. (laughs) I'll break the news to Edward. That means I can come back because I have three more sections to uh, this lecture, actually four, and then the very important message that I really am sent to deliver to you. So let's come back early and uh, I bid you enjoy a macrobiotic breakfast (laughs) which consists of the most marvelous rice and oat cereal and the most marvelous miso soup. And after that, if you're not satisfied, you can eat anything you want to eat that you're used to eating, but that is a great breakfast, and uh, it's wonderful. And tomorrow I'm going to tell you what's wonderful about it uh, in all of your overcoming, and what's wonderful about it in time of transition and survival and dealing with uh, radiation, nuclear fallout, and all of the problems of chemical warfare uh, that threaten the entire planet with pollution and how our bodies can, through this diet, come to the stage of being repellents and rejecting those conditions, and why we therefore must prepare our bodies and put them through a course of change so that they become more alkaline than acidic in nature in the bloodstream, and so that they are able to digest, fully digest, grains and vegetables and other products of the sea as we have accustomed ourselves to living off of meats and dairy products, there is a period of transition where the body learns to digest and derive its proteins, create its own vitamins from this 
absolute balance of the yin and yang. So it's a very complete system. And of course, it is yours only by free will. But you know, I have a zest for alchemy and being a scientist in the laboratory of the human body. And I don't fear to experiment. And you know, that ancient prophecy of Jesus has always been a curious one to me, where he said that you would drink any deadly thing and it will not hurt you. How do you get to that state where you can drink any deadly thing and it will not hurt you? You know, there's prophecies in scripture about the waters turning to blood and the sulfur and that uh, chemicalization rendering toxic the systems of the earth. We have a right to survive, and if we have a will to survive, we will. Thank you very much. It's great to see you in one hall, one room full of people. How much overflow is there? Is there a lot of it in the other rooms? Anyway, we haven't seen this many people in one place in a long time. (laughs) Never in Camelot except in our tents. I can lecture all evening and look at a different face every second. (laughs) Let's have our closing. Beloved Mighty I Am Presence, we raise to you, beloved Archangel Michael, this crystal chalice, which is indeed the divine image of that chalice of the Holy Grail, fashioned after the divine crystal who is Christ the Lord, we would present ourselves in our bodies, minds, and souls, in our feelings and in our thoughts, O God, with the precision of this magnificent sapphire and white crystal. We thank you for the opportunity to serve. We thank you for your call that we might stay yet another day and praise the Lord, our Sanat Kumara.